Welcome to the Investor Frame Podcast. I'm here today with uh, one of my good friends, Anson Roberts. We're going to be uh, talking about his story. He's got a super cool story and how he got into real estate. Um, so excited to have you here. Welcome, yeah, Anson. Awesome. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, man. Um, so you and I met pretty recently, and uh, I was really just impressed by the way that you've approached business and what you're doing now. And I'm excited to kind of share that story um, or have you share that story. But <clears throat> let's start by like tell everybody what your background is and how you – uh, how you got from um, maybe starting your career into the beginning of where you started real estate. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so from a career standpoint, man, I, I had no idea where I was going to start and what I was going to do. And I ended up falling into the automotive space um, via a good friend of mine, apprenticed me specifically in um, the painless dent removal space. So, you know, hail damage, door mm-hmm. dents, that kind of stuff. So, um, I moved to Colorado with my wife in 2012. And at that point it was, we didn't have kids, we didn't have a house and didn't have a business at that point. And so it was um, us getting into a uh, into an area that we actually wanted to kind of set up and do family and do life. And so started the business out here that was um, automotive dent removal. That was my world and my reality for quite a few years um, and really focused on building that and um, it grew uh, in regards to the services we provided. You know, we got to the point at one, uh, at one point in time where um, we had three locations around the Denver area and then expanded into a full body shop. And um, there was a lot of good uh, that came out of that. There was also, it was a grind. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I frankly got burnt out just within that. And, you know, I think some of that comes from... Uh, skills that I now have, I didn't have at that point in running operations or business in the team aspects. Um, so, uh, kind of fast forward a bit. This is about two years, two and a half years ago, right? Uh, some point, uh, in COVID I was curious about what I might do if I ever changed tracks. And I actually thought about Man, if I have to put together a resume, I'm screwed. Right. <laughs> Most of us entrepreneurs are. I was like, wh- where do I go? Yeah. What do I do? And I've got a family, I've got my kids. So you had built this business yeah. over the course of, you know, 2012 to 2000, let's say 19. Yeah. And, you know, you, what I'm hearing is you, you built it to the point where you're like, I don't really want this business anymore. Yeah. Is it not really serving me and what I want in life? Yeah, for sure. And I, I enjoyed business. And I realized I didn't um, love the actual work I was doing, the Mm -hmm. industry that I was in. Um, And that's a hard uh, thing to look at in the mirror. Mm -hmm. You're like, man, I built this thing. Yeah. And what, how do I get out? How do I exit this kind of situation? So, um, so the idea came up around, okay, where can I possibly dip my toes into the real estate space? I've enjoyed previously the um, few interactions I've had within the industry. And that's looked like, I mean, even starting young, I grew up around the construction with my dad mm-hmm. to um, our first home was um, up in Sunnyside. And that was one that we fixed up, ended up selling our next home. You and your wife did that. Mm-hmm. Got it. Yep. And then the next home um, that we, we were still in was a full gut. Mm-hmm. And um, and so managed that, ne- not really ever having managed um, a full rehab project. And so, you know, definitely got a crash course in the midst of doing that. Um, and then a little bit in the commercial space, but I had never run a uh, real estate deal in regards to, uh, from the flip aspect, specifically to turn a profit at like a disposition and selling this thing, we need to clear, you know, whatever percentage of the numbers that we're targeting. So, um, so dip my toes in those waters. And is this while you were still operating mm-hmm. that business? Yep. Yep. So doing this simultaneously. And you know, what you're saying is, um, so the title of this show is called The Investor mm-hmm. Frame. And for those who, who listen, they know that what The Investor Frame says is knowing what I know now, what I choose to opt into my current situation. Yeah. And oftentimes, I mean, I'm sure you've seen this and it sounds like you've probably experienced this in the same way I have is we maintain these, you know, convenience assets, right? You could look at uh, rental properties you maintain. You could look at businesses you maintain. You could look at friendships that you maintain, yeah. right? Because, well, I've known this person since we were in college and we're just still buddies. And it's like, well, 
you know, knowing what you know now, yeah. would you choose to, you know, buy your business back? Would you buy that same rental property? Would you still, you know, go seek out that friend? And if not, well, that's a very informative information. Yeah. And it sounds like you reached that crossroads, like right as COVID. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so you started doing some fix and flips and then, you know, what happened from there? Yeah. Um, it will. And I also say, I mean, I, yeah, I love that the way that you articulated that. Um, because it is, if we do not choose to operate with a level of awareness and agency, like our circumstances will continue to be them. And then we like get frustrated and we stay in the place that we're in and we never see the change that like we want to experience. And then 20 years go by and we go, what happened? Mm -hmm. And, and that was the moment for me of like, I, I, I that's not going to be the story. Right. <laughs> so, um, so coming back into the flip space, um, yeah, so we started the first one. In the midst of starting the first one, I somehow ended up picking up two others. And next thing I knew, I was in the midst of doing three houses. Wow. And, um, you know, the first one actually uh, just broke even. Mm -hmm. But uh, what it did do was it got me in the door and get, get, getting my feet wet versus just analyzing, analyzing, analyzing. Which a lot and, of people obviously get stuck in that in that space. Um and so the first deal almost never goes how you how you want it to go. If it goes too well, it's almost like your head gets too big. Sure. And you need that first deal to kind of keep you grounded yeah, a little bit. Totally. Um, sounds like you had the same thing I did, which is I barely made any money on right. my first fix and flip. Right. Yeah. Right. And and in that you, you have the opportunity of um, that becomes it can become a judgment on you uh, not being able to hack it, though, or, or much less even going to the route of approaching that as this was a, um, a failed attempt at something, or it's just data. Mm -hmm. <laughs> here's the things that here, here's what went well, that went well on the project. Here are the areas and why this did not go well. And the good thing is we have another at bat here in a minute yeah. and we can kind of uh, refocus. So, yeah. So, um, you know, over the past two years, uh, it's been about, it's, I think we're at eight. Um, and all of the projects that I've done from a flip standpoint have all been pretty significant. Um, you know, minimum six figures, not if not multiple six figure full. You're counts. not doing cosmetic stuff. Uh, yeah, I haven't. Um, and it's interesting. I was talking to a friend about this the other day, trying to understand why I ended up going that route. And part of it was um, if I could underwrite the deal with big enough margins, I felt like I had room to have like to make mistakes. Yeah. Versus, hey, we, you know, there's a, there's a 20 case. $40,000 in profit. Yeah. And so that was part of the approach was, okay, it's a bigger undertaking, but there is room mm -hmm. um, to work with. So, um, yeah, so that's been leading up to, you know, um, up to present day. And then, um, you know, it was six plus months ago, started to realize, okay, Engaging in the flipping space has been good and it served a purpose that I did not fully understand that I needed coming out of the gate. Uh, being really burned out on building a business mm -hmm. with employees and everything associated with building a business. Um, I needed a break, but obviously like not a break entirely from doing any kind of work, but I need a break from like that space. Mm -hmm. And, you know, operating and doing flips, it can go two ways. It can either be a project or you can build a business around it. Yep. And those are two very different things. And what I've done is I've been doing projects mm -hmm. and, you know, obviously trying to do those as efficiently as I can and operate and like, you know, have some great teams and great subs we've worked with, but it's not building out all these layers of management and here's the exact system and here's the exact finishes we use for every single house. They've all been really unique yep. and approaching it really creatively. But, you know, now in hindsight, I realized that, man, like my heart, my mind needed that space. Um, the decreased even level of responsibility um, versus the, uh, to, to operate and grow a business well, the level of ownership and weight that one takes on with that. And so it's only been within the last six months that um, I've, you know, been able to recognize, okay, there's a little bit of an ember there back in my heart and like being ready to build. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I haven't honestly felt that kind of, um, flame. And it's been not just over the past two years, it's been quite a few years where like the fire has been present of, 
okay, I'm ready to put my head down. And do you think it was the, the industry that was burning you out or was the process of building the business that was burning you out? Uh, there's a few things. Um, building a business within the automotive industry, especially in this specific niche that we were in is, um, objectively really challenging. Even, you know, I've had a, uh, a partner who came in who's helping run um, that business over there the, you know, now who's operated and built several of the businesses. And even from his perspective, he's like, I underestimated how hard this industry is. Hmm. And so that part of it is just industry specific. Part of it were some like really challenging team dynamics and core, core team member issues internally. And also now... Um, being able to see um, a lack of skillfulness, honestly, from my end, there is some like serious ownership of why things became so challenging of ways that I just was not equipped to, uh, to navigate in a really skillful way. And so um, there was big dreams and big goals. And, um, and now in hindsight, I'm like, okay, um, I see where, okay, this could have been done a little bit differently, could have approached this relationship in this way that, you know, the downstream effect was, was significant compounding over, over years. And so the, the actual burnout aspect comes from feeling like you're pushing something uphill for years, very rarely feeling like there's momentum and you're just pushing, pushing, pushing something. Mm -hmm. And talking about coming back to what you were bringing up a little bit ago, at some point it's like, there's a lot of talk around the grind and you put your head down and you get the work done regardless of how it feels and you go. And there's also, uh, there was an awareness that grew of, I feel like I'm swimming against the current all yeah. the time. And so being able to channel uh, one's energy, be able to operate with a level of intuition to see where, where the water's moving. And I had a friend who, to go with that analogy, had shared with me a couple of years ago that stuck with me is instead of feeling like you have to swim upstream 24 seven, you can take the same amount of energy and literally swim with the current. Yeah. And so dialing into that, both from a like, like high level industry analysis, even, and then all the way to the side of like, what gets me jazzed mm -hmm. and then being able to like bring those two pieces together um, and not, uh, and having the humility to say, okay, I, I think I'm going to start, stop barking up this tree. I'm going to, you know, call out the areas that I've missed the mark, either that I even failed in some ways, and we're going to pivot and move this direction. And so that was a, um, um, I, I've made my way through that. It hasn't always been graceful. <laughs> Sometimes it's been kicking and screaming. Sometimes I've even needed like the circumstances to force me to make some of those decisions and come to those um, awarenesses. But uh, thankfully, um, there is a little bit of space between me and that now, uh, mm -hmm. as of today. So I want to ask you a question because a lot, like I resonate with a lot of the things that you've said, you've been in business for, you know, yourself quite a bit longer than I have. Um, but that process of recognizing the gap between your confidence and your actual abilities, mm -hmm. right? I think a lot of business owners, they get into this and they just, um, they're so overconfident and, uh, and we call this Mount stupid, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you rise to the top of Mount stupid and it's a really hard fall. And then there's the slope of enlightenment on the way up. Um, but what would you say to the, the, you know, cause, cause business can be very, very rewarding, mm -hmm. um, for a lot of reasons. One, it can create financial security. One, it can give you two, it can give you a lot of purpose and, you know, motivation to, to succeed and impact others and all these reasons why we do it. Um, but if I could go back and tell young Paul, mm -hmm. I'd be like, you need to put your ego aside. There's so many things that you don't understand yet yeah. about building a business. And you got to keep your eyes and ears open and learn from those uh, who come before you and drop the ego a little bit. That's what got me in trouble. Um, what would you say to someone who's who's looking to get into business for themselves, who's going to have all this confidence, they're coming in guns blazing? What would you say to that person? A couple of things. Um, first is, I wish I would have uh, 
been more intimately familiar with my my gut, my intuition, mm. and that I would have trusted it. Mm -hmm. I can look at a lot of uh, situations, small and large, um, that were challenging at best and almost unbearable at worst, that there are clear moments that I didn't trust my intuition. Mm -hmm. Because of what was sitting there in the highest priority for me was growth. Right. Was like, uh, you know, setting goals or just growth for growth's sake. That's not even necessarily directed. I mean, f for me, like I, I spent so many years not even knowing why I was growing. What, what was, how was I going to actually judge the success or failure of that? It was literally just sprinting full out right. for years. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, um, my, my intuition and my gut was subservient to that mm -hmm. and versus like trusting this space, getting really clear about why I'm doing what I'm doing, the direction I'm going and trusting that like whatever that voice is inside of us is actually going to work with us in serving that and then being able to help filter my decisions through that. Mm -hmm. When that, that, that uh, manifested in like poor hiring decisions, um, in taking on like, uh, there's, you know, at one point we had three locations. One of those, I flat out objectively should not have done. But it was growth for growth's sake. Sure. I had, there were flags internally. There was, you know, um, um, there was reservations about it that at that point, I was, I think I just chalked up uh, as fear. Mm -hmm. It was like, I'm not going to be controlled by fear. And it was actually, uh, it was, now I can see uh, a part of me trying to like offer some guidance. So, so dialing into one's own, like, and, but, yeah, their intuition, but that, that has to come from like a deep level of self-awareness and clarity, right? And clarity. And you have to know who you are. Like mm -hmm. it's hard to listen to that space internally if you don't know who the hell you are. Well, and because humans are hardwired to chase more, Yeah. you know, um, I, I use this example all the time. We call it the woolly mammoth example. You know, our brains have evolved over thousands and thousands of years, um, Back in the day when our brains were forming, um, we didn't know where our next meal came from, right? So we had we had to take advantage of every opportunity that we had. Um, and it's that scarcity mindset that is still with us today. And so our tendency is not to be satisfied. It's to chase more and more and more. And that's biological. Um, so... You know, the, the, the first wealth commandment that we have and we call the certainty operating system says we want to get closer to the things that we want without chasing more. And how do you know whether you're getting closer to the things that you want if you don't have clarity around what it is you want? Um, a lot of people confuse money for the end all be all of why we're in business or why we do certain things. And I think it takes a little bit of experience after a while to say, you know, although I could grow and I could do these different things, that doesn't necessarily help me get more of the things that I actually want in life. Um, and I took off without any clarity into business and you just start doing things because you're like, oh, I could make more money if I did this. And if that becomes your, you know, your, what you're measuring everything against, I can make more money to do this. Well, you're not considering all the trade-offs to that. The trade-offs are burnout. There's risk that you're, you know, I think about the, the entrepreneur who spends head down 10, 15 years grinding, and then he picks his head up and he's an alcoholic and his wife wants nothing to do with him. His kids want nothing to do with him. But guess what, bud? You hit your, you know, hit your revenue goal. You got your $10 million exit that you want. And it's like, but at, at what cost, right? And so clarity is the first thing that we've got to have um, but, but what's your opinion on what happens when that, what you want changes? Because what I wanted three years ago yeah. is very different than what I want now. It's pretty reasonable to assume it's going to be different than what I want three years from now. So how do you manage that? How do you manage the fact that throughout life, what we want and what we're trying to optimize for is going to change? Um, it, what first comes to mind with that is setting the stage for that question um, in a way that is approaching it as 
as an opportunity versus a problem to be solved. Um, the, the, the opposite side of that is to think, okay, we find, we find or we discern the thing that we are supposed to do, and then we just do that till the day we die. Or there is this evolution, this constant like iterative process of new passions arising. Mm-hmm. And that being like, that's really beautiful. Like, because the first way is pretty rigid, right? It is like, really rigid, and I think there's there's the handful of people who like they find their thing early and they are they are dialed, yeah. And that's 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 amazing. I know for me, like I love new opportunities. I love learning like entirely new industries. And so the second part to to answering that is, um, I know as I become more um, in tune with who I am, like what my values are how I want to to operate and operating in a, in a aligned way is like something that's really, really core for me that making those shifts um, becomes, there's less friction in it. Yeah. And because I'm trusting, again, coming back to the intuition piece, I'm trusting what's going on in here and um, I'm putting in the work in a way and operating with a level of discipline that I, I can be honest with myself that I'm, it's not just ch- uh, shiny object sh- syndrome mm-hmm. that I just want to bounce because something's a little bit difficult and I don't want to do it anymore. But honoring the fact that there is this fluid nature of like my heart and like how I want to engage in the world. And well, you're dealing with scrutiny, right? Cause everybody else is like, Hey, you're giving up on this already kind totally, of thing. Totally. You know, you see, so you feel this scrutiny, um, and there's not – there's a big difference between preference-based decisions and right or wrong binary decisions. 100%. It's like, is this right or wrong? Well, it's not a, pre- it's not a binary question. Very this is a preference. Very few of these things are right or wrong questions. I mean, almost nothing. Like right. we have a, we have a, a, a you know, way of determining whether it's preference or binary and we yeah. say, can I Google the answer? Yeah. Like if I go on Google and I say, what's the color of the sky? It's going to give me a pretty binary answer. But if I say, what's my favorite color? Right. It can't like what you should or shouldn't do in business yeah. is oftentimes confused. Like, and you'll, you'll, you'll ask people, what should I do? Right. And it's like, really, that's just a reflection of your own insecurities because they don't have all the information. Yeah. They're not making a decision objectively based off all the data. They're just saying what they would do if they were in your your shoes, but how can they understand that? Yeah, um, yeah so yeah. it's 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 a dangerous game to try to like, you know, have you know you're trying to play your game. Like I'm trying to align with who I am, but I'm also going to ask other people, "What do you think I should do?" Yeah. That's really dangerous. Yeah. I have absolutely um, lived under the thumb previously, and if I'm not conscious of it, I can still at moments today of making my decisions, um, living with a level of, uh, anxiety driven awareness around what other people think like, and maybe that's something that is, uh, has some level of presence the rest of my life. I don't know, but that there has become a lot of freedom as like, I recognize that, man, this is frankly, it's my, it's my life. <laughs> and a lot of the weight I give to other people, um, at the end of the day, they honestly aren't thinking about me as much as I think they are. Right, of course. They go to bed and they're likely not wondering about my business decision, even though they made a comment about it. Mm-hmm. And um, frankly, in you know, call it seventy years, we're both going to be dead anyways. <laughs> and there, there's like a there's a candidness around that of like this is this is the life. Yeah, it's here now. And uh, and frankly, it, it's mine to navigate. If I misstep, I can't point to someone else and say, but you, because you weighed in on this opinion, this is your, like, I have to, I have to own it. There's trade-offs to that, right? right? Totally. Well, that can either be like a, like a um, burdensome weight or man, that is like super empowering. Mm -hmm. But that's like, that's, that's for the individual to decide. Are you crushed by the responsibility that you can't blame this on anyone else? Mm -hmm. Or are you empowered by, oh, I get to, I get to sit in the driver's seat. Like, and those are two very different lives. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the, one of the things I was going to mention in that regards as well is with, I've got two kids, they're five and eight. It really makes this stuff, really makes it really real, if, to say real. 
quite a few times. Um, as I think about the people that I want to encourage them to be and the way I want them to like relate to themselves. You know, talking to my daughter, she comes home from school and her in tears weighing because weighing something that she's, uh, she has curiosities about and expressing herself because of something else so another kid said. And my heart is just like, no girl, like do you, mm -hmm. you are beautiful. Like you are incredible, do you? And then I have to go look in the mirror and be like, <laughs> Anson, like it's the same conversation. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's, that's a really helpful aspect for me is, is, is um, the parenting piece and the way that intersects with a lot, honestly, a lot of the questions that, that you've asked you. I love that. Um, I want to ask you something that I, I haven't actually asked on this, this show, but I think uh, I'm excited to, to hear what was when you were a kid you were growing up. What was your favorite sport or hobby? Like, did you play sports? Did you do any hobbies? Yeah. Um, so soccer was my main gem. Okay. So and soccer. Then, and then I got into climbing as well. And that that's kind of the main hobby as well. What kind of a soccer player or climber? Like, what what position did you play? How did you play the game when yeah. you were young? Um, so from a positional standpoint, uh, center mid was my jam. Were you aggressive? Were you the scorer? Were you the, like, get me the ball? Yeah. So, um, I was the, uh, like put in the work, mm -hmm. like I, I was not the most talented. I played pretty competitively, uh, but I was not the most talented. And so, I mean, it, it goes into intersecting with life today. Um, I was more so trusted to like follow what the instructions are for the game plan around what the team needed to do mm -hmm. um, to be in support of the team, I think is something I did really well and um, distribution, like being able to be the center point of moving things around in the game. Mm -hmm. um, but I, yeah, on a practical standpoint, I also was the guy who was there before practice and after practice because I was like, I'm not as talented as these guys. Yeah. <laughs> and so, well, so I had a mentor who did this exercise with me recently and he was like, the way you played as a kid mm. is how you play your game. Mm. And as we grow up and we accumulate these responsibilities and all these, the scrutiny and the expectations yeah. that you experience as you get older, you oftentimes can get further and further away from playing your game. But the way he was promoting it to me was like the way you played when you were a kid is your purest expression of how mm. you play the game. Right. And so he's trying to help me align with you know my businesses yeah. and all my investments and the different things that I do with with that style um, because it's it's like your natural tendencies because yeah. uh, as kids we don't we don't we're just we're just expressing who we are you know in a in a true sense especially in sports when brain kind of turns off mm -hmm. the outside world and you're focused on what you're doing um, and I found that really helpful and I found I find it interesting to you know to observe people like are you know if you were the person who was there before practice and who was putting in the work and who was you know the team player it's like well that's probably how you build businesses as well would yeah. you agree yeah yeah no that's um that's a really uh, incredible kind of like way to approach um some of that internal reflection and yeah i i see the the carryovers um in the ways of operating and some principle-based stuff uh, absolutely Awesome. Yeah. So you have a, another business and another venture that you're yeah. working on right now. Tell me more about that. Yeah. So, um, as I mentioned, kind of feeling, uh, the fire come back, um, from a building standpoint, uh, business related. Um, I recognize that I've enjoyed the flip space. Um, but also I, I was not clear, uh, about building the business around that. And thankfully there's an intuition piece that I was actually listening to this time around that. So, uh, my wife and I have actually operated an Airbnb for about five years now. Um, we have a carriage house behind our main residence and it's been a wonderful experience. And, um, the wheel started turning around. Okay. I know this business from a uh, kind of micro level, like not at scale, but I could see that, oh, there is a absolutely a path of scalability to this. And so, um, yeah, so that journey has started in building uh, an Airbnb business and, um, and, and not just Airbnb, obviously the whole short term rental space across different platforms and direct bookings and all that good stuff. And specifically with that business, 
uh, which is called Tailored Stays, there are uh, two to three main spheres in the way that that manifests in the way that I operate. So uh, the first is a actual acquisition art, like finding properties and then bringing those into the portfolio, doing that with partners a lot of times. So this is all here in Colorado? No, nope, not just Colorado. So you're so, talking about Texas. Yeah. yeah. So uh, closed on a property a couple months ago down in Crystal Beach, Texas, which is yes. a Gulf kind of beach town. And um, that's an amazing kind of like little mini retreat of sorts. So that's 11 bed with, wow. um, you know, in ground heated pools and we're putting in new game rooms and workout studios and all this kind of stuff into the space. And it's, um, it's in mid process for that right now. And we should be live here in a couple of weeks. And um, so, uh, so there's that side of acquiring and, and from an acquisition standpoint, there's really two things that we're looking at. Either um, large luxury single family homes um, and also small to medium size um, hotels, motels. And converting those into kind of a boutique um, tech driven um, experience. That's cool. So the other aspect is management. And, um, and that is predominantly in Colorado right now. Um, I'm obviously managing that property that's in Crystal Beach. Um, I actually have one that um, we're working on helping the owner go through a design process and then managing that's in Florida. And so there's, there, that's kind of spread around. Um, but, you know, t being able to offer, uh, honestly, A to Z, um, start to finish management for short-term rentals. That includes everything from helping from a design build-out standpoint to um, the distribution of that property to all the platforms that are out there, direct bookings, mm -hmm. managing guest communication, managing handyman, and really making, at the end of the day, uh, a product that a homeowner investor is able to uh, simply collect a check yeah. and a report once a month. Because because short-term rentals are not passive. Far from it. Right. Far Everybody's like, oh, well, yeah, I, I thought the same thing. We have a couple of uh, short-term rentals, and they can be passive-ish if you set up all your businesses. But it's kind of like what you brought up earlier about – you know, projects with fix and flips, it's very different than actually having a whole business, you know, right. machine that's turning these things out. Um, so, uh, so you work primarily with investors and homeowners that want to set up an Airbnb. Maybe they don't know, you know, how to furnish it or how right. to go about that. They don't want to deal with managing it. And so they would call you and you'd come in and you'd do all that. Correct. Yep. And, you know, the name of the company is called Tailored Stays. And it's, for me, it truly is more than just a name. The idea is I want to create tailored products for anyone that's wanting to engage in that space. Mm -hmm. And so I'm um, going to talk to someone right now around actually partnering with them and the um, analyzing and selecting a market mm. and a specific property type and then sourcing properties, being able to find them the right house that can produce numbers that they need it to from a cash on cash standpoint. So you're then providing the whole thing. Like, and, and honestly, being able to tailor those packages to to really make the space accessible, whether it's someone who wants to invest in a like, almost like a syndication level hotel, all the way down to the person who really, they want to get into their, uh, their first investment property for their family and it needs to check these certain boxes yeah. and being able to help uh, in, in multiple spheres like that. And it's so... Uh... Um, unless you're going to go at like, I see a lot of, of investors that will go at one particular market. And the one I'm thinking of for whatever reason is Joshua tree. Mm, yeah. Right. And it's like, you'll see this, these guys scoop up 10, 20 properties all in one market, but that doesn't sound like what you're doing. You're custom fitting more of like the client to, to find the deal, to underwrite the deal. I'm sure. You're using air DNA and all yeah. these tools yeah. that we, you know, have and, um, you know, I, I really like that because it's such a, it is a personal experience. You're not necessarily serving the large 
guy is going to go out and buy 10, 12 units in one place. You're serving more of the, the, the custom, I want a custom tailor fit solution to what I'm trying to do, whether it's one property or a syndication in a you know, small boutique hotel, uh, which is just such a cool space. I'm sure it allows you to play to your strengths and play your game, which is you know, creatively doing these projects, um, you know, building again. You, you know, obviously, you mentioned, like, I like to build. You just get burned out. Um, so I'm just, that's super cool to see you building that. It's an evolution of the last decade or of you being in business. 100%. And I'm um, trying to, to learn from the areas that uh, were problematic in the past and not in the same areas twice. Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> there, there's been this like value that's arisen for me that I found myself journaling about is uh, um, that I, I want to be a master at failing, meaning, uh, that my, my failures are fuel in the tank. They are and like some of the ba- best data that I can get. And I learn from them and I change course so that um, I, I improve in a way that is only accessible because of the failures that I had um, or the missteps and whatever those may be. So, um, so that looks like practically um, forcing myself to be way more systems oriented than I've ever been. It's building SOPs for everything. Yeah. It is um, bringing in the, the proper team earlier, almost earlier than I think I need them. Yeah. So that, because what I do enjoy is that I enjoy working with people. I enjoy sourcing capital. I enjoy underwriting deals for a family that like want to do their first investment property. Yeah. Like that's, that's my jam. Um, and so uh, building it in a way to where I can play to my streets, like feels like what is needed for me to not you know, us to touch base in 10 years and now I'm burnt out of this business, <laughs> you know, where it is actually sustainable and that I, and I love what I do and I can show up and be present for my family and my friends and, and enjoy life along the way versus grinding for the hell of it. Yeah, grinding. We did a, we have a comment, we have a phrase that we say, we got to stop grinding and start sculpting, yeah. right? The idea is like this grinding is just like head down. You, you yeah. just don't pick your head up for 10 years and it's the analogy of like, well, what kind of trade-offs are you not even realizing that you're making by doing that Um, we give an extreme example of the alcoholic who's getting a divorce and his kids hate him and it's like it doesn't have to be that bad but um you know you can certainly be getting further and further away just grinding away if you pick your head up as a sculptor would they're going to make a chip and then they're going to look at it and they're going to make another chip yeah and also, I reserve the right to change my mind, totally. right? What I want now. And so maybe this will resonate with you. The way I've sort of described what it is that I want out of business is to be able to play business as a sport. Yeah. Um, what I mean by that is I know that I like to figure things out. Yeah. And then I'm kind of like, I already figured that out. I want to move on to something else. Right? I want to try different things. I want to do different things. I want to structure these different deals and I want to raise capital. And I like relationships just like you do. And if I get pulled into an operating role inside of a business, it takes me out of my element of, uh, of who I am and playing what my game is. And so I've got to build my businesses quickly around how do I build this and then bring in the right person that's going to run it. Or we just need to get rid of it. Yeah. Right, because if I have to run it, it's going to it's going to be a grind, and I'm not going to be able to sculpt anything. It's just, uh, but clarity around who you are, and you know, it's easy to be like, oh, I'm the I'm a I'm a founder, right? I don't do that sort of stuff. There's there's trade offs to saying that as well too early in the business, and that just takes experience from my my experience it's like well if you're trying to move out of the business too soon and go start something else now you got all these things that you're trying to do and none of them's getting nothing's getting done that's the biggest risk that i see so um all right so you've got the you got the flipping are you still flipping right now yeah yeah there's a couple going on at the moment yep yep tough market to be flipping in right now right yeah so two are actually we we have one going too so we're like get rid of this thing i know know. (laughs) yeah um, and so you've got your Airbnbs, uh, and it seems like you are now getting more aligned with your game. And it's just a result of trial and error. It's a result of failing, right? There's some Churchill, Winston Churchill quote or something that's like, it, your ability to be successful has everything to do with your ability to fail and just keep going. Yeah. Just keep pushing through those failures, and they can be brutal, Um that's one thing they don't tell you when you get into entrepreneurship. They're like, oh, it's going to be hard. And you're like, 
I can handle it. I'm tough. Right. And it's like, you just wait. Right. Just wait. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so. What, a thousand days into that feeling and still choosing to like go back to bat. Yeah. Failure doesn't get any easier. You just get better at dealing with it. Right. right? right. And it's the stoic philosophy, right? You yeah. kind of mentioned that uh, before. It's, um, well, what do I have control over? Why am I going to continue doing something that's no longer serving me? Because in 70 years, we're going to be gone. And like, who, six months after you're gone, no one's going to talk about you. Like, and, you know, it's just a flash in the pan. Yeah. Uh, so what really matters here? Yeah. Um, aligning with your true purpose, I think. Spending time with the people that we love. Pouring into those relationships. Yeah. That's how I see it. And um, Yeah, I thought this was a great conversation. Yeah. You got anything else you want to add? No. I, um, no, this has been super valuable. And it's um, this kind of dialogue is – I'm honestly grateful that you're doing it because um, – it is it's so necessary and it's so supportive and valuable um, to people in their journey. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I look forward to more conversations in this space and love to see what you're doing. Awesome, man. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming. Appreciate you, uh, having you on. And um, if you guys want to go check out the, uh, the video, it'll be up here pretty soon. So thanks, Anson. Yeah, for sure. All right. All right thanks, Paul.